This is week three of our Easter season sermon series, Faith Matters. <laughs> Since you're uh, watching this service right now, your faith is undoubtedly important to you. But depending on where you are on your faith journey, depending on how long you've been in the church, depending on how much thought you've given this question, you may or may not be able to easily articulate why your faith is important to you. Why does our faith matter? For many of us, the answer to that question is more intuitive than uh, top of mind. But I would argue that these days, perhaps more than at any other time in my lifetime, having some clarity about why our faith matters is actually pretty important. First of all, because we, we live in an increasingly secular world. Throughout this series, we've been talking about a recent Gallup poll that shows that only 47% of Americans consider themselves to be members of a church, synagogue, or mosque. That's down from a high of 76% shortly after World War II. That number has been dropping precipitously in this century for a, a host of reasons, not all of which are entirely clear. But the reality is that there is now less than a 50-50 chance that the average American has a church home. All of us have neighbors, friends, maybe even family members who do not get the importance of faith. We're also living, as I'm sure you've noticed, in an increasingly multi-faith community. Our kids and grandkids are more likely to have friends who uh, belong to other religious traditions. Each of us almost certainly has friends or neighbors or co-workers of other faiths. A week ago Friday, I was on a call for Plano ISD with uh, community faith leaders to discuss recent challenges facing our school district having to do with bullying and racism. Uh, there were six faith leaders on that call with a, a small group of Plano ISD officials. The six of us represented four different religions, <laughs> not four different Christian denominations, four different religions. Now, there are tremendous blessings that come with being in a multicultural, multi-faith community. We have plenty both to learn from and share with those of other cultures and religions. I'm grateful to live in a diverse community. But speaking as both a pastor and a parent, I think that an important gift that we bring to those relationships is clarity about just what it is that we believe and why it's important to us. Back when I was a, a logistics consultant, we used to, to talk about the elevator speech. You may have heard of this concept before. The elevator speech meant that uh, if we were to get on an elevator with the CEO of the company we were working for and she or he asked us what we were doing for them, we needed to be able to succinctly articulate the details of the project we were working on before the CEO reached their floor, who we were, uh, what problem we were trying to solve, how we were helping their company, basically why whatever project they were paying us to do mattered. In this series, uh, we're, we're kind of working through our elevator speech for the faith the elevator speech that we would be able to give someone who asks what we believe and why. Which is to say, we're spending these five weeks exploring the question of why Christianity matters. How is Christianity relevant in the 21st century? Why do we believe that people need a faith foundation? What message are we preaching both with our words and with our lives to the 53% of Americans who do not yet have a church home. So far, we've talked about our common humanity. That was in week one. Uh, the great theological truth that we are all created in the image and likeness of God and how, because of that fact, everyone is invited into a relationship with God. Our refrain in week one was Peter's great realization in the early days of the Christian movement that God shows no partiality. Then last week, week two, we talked about our common problem, the, the inescapable fact that despite being created in the image and likeness of God, we have a tendency to uh, deny or reject or ignore 
the divinity within each of us, which leads to all kinds of self-destructive heartache and misery, as well as brokenness in the world. And our refrain last week was Paul's memorable phrase that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which leads us to what we're talking about today, our, our common solution. We're continuing our focus on the Acts of the Apostles, as we've been discussing. The book of Acts is the story of how the early church made sense of what God had done in Christ. There are lots of wonderful stories in Acts about what those, those earliest disciples did. There are also a fair number of speeches, some 28 in all, detailing what those earliest disciples said about their young movement. Today, for the third week in a row, we're hearing from Peter. The very first sermon in Christian history is the one that Peter preaches on Pentecost. We always read that story on Pentecost each year, which is actually three weeks from now. But today, we're going we're gonna to pick up that sermon uh, where the Pentecost reading normally leaves off. So this is the end of that very first sermon and a little bit about its effects on the people who heard it. So this is uh, the book of Acts, chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 22 through 24, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 32 and finish that second chapter. Actually, just go through verse 40 of that second chapter. So listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the author of Acts. This is Peter speaking. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Jump into verse 32. This God Jesus raised up, and of, of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As Christians, we believe that in our common humanity, our our common solution to our common problem of sin is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. We believe that in his incarnation, ministry, and teachings, death, and resurrection, Christ has reconciled us to God. We believe that our faith in him puts us in a right relationship with God, which is what it means to be saved. We believe that the cross is an important part of the story of our salvation, and over the centuries, different theologians have offered a variety of theories about the meaning of the cross. Here in the book of Acts, the meaning of the cross is actually quite straightforward. It's the result of human sin. Throughout Acts, Peter repeats a variation on this same theme. It's human sin which so often results in fear and hatred and bigotry and violence that led to the cross. Peter calls for repentance 
which is to say he calls the people to turn, to have a change of heart and place their faith in Christ and be baptized. And he promises that baptism will bring the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is when the true transformation begins. What we see in this second chapter of Acts at the end of the very first sermon in Christian history is the core of apostolic preaching, our common solution, namely that salvation is ours when we place our faith in Christ, salvation being a very churchy word, which means to be in a right relationship with God. Being in a right relationship with God means both that our sins are forgiven and that the Holy Spirit begins to work within us to transform us, to empower us to grow in our love for God and our fellow human beings. And we believe that Christ invites all, everyone, to this transformation. We just read it. For the promise is for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. When we say yes to God by responding to Christ's call, we are saved. Peter says, quote unquote, from this corrupt generation, receiving both forgiveness and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And in this beautiful and powerful way, our common solution to our common problem helps us to see our common humanity. All of these, all these concepts are are really inextricably linked. Which brings me to our theologian for today. Each week throughout this series, we're highlighting a a variety of theologians from uh, the course of human, of our Christian history, rather. Our premise is that uh, just as the book of Acts helps us to understand the earliest theology of those first Christian preachers, so theologians throughout history can help us to think through the challenges of our current place and time. And as the church in America, I'm not sure that we face a bigger challenge right now than our very difficult national conversation about race, just the mention of which can can raise anxiety and tension. James Cone was one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century. Born in Arkansas in 1938, He was raised in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He was a a Methodist. He was educated uh, at both the Methodist Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and then later at Northwestern University for his doctoral work. He spent most of his career teaching at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And the year he died, 2018, he was elected a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences an organization founded in 1780 by John Adams, John Hancock, and other founding fathers. Cone is required reading in United Methodist seminaries. His theology was groundbreaking, and it would influence an entire generation of theologians and church leaders, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a name that you know. His first two books, titled... uh, Black Theology and Black Power, and A Black Theology of Liberation, written in 1969 and 1970, respectively, set the trajectory of his storied career and began the work that he spent his lifetime pursuing. Like most Methodist preachers of my generation, I read excerpts of Cone in seminary and studied his work, but until recently I had not read one of his books in its entirety. A few years ago, a black colleague of mine who pastors a Methodist church in Dallas recommended one of Cone's last books, 2011's The Cross and the Lynching Tree. He told me that it was one of the most important books he had ever read, and so, uh, like I do with far too many books, I, I bought a copy, and on a shelf it sat. And then came last summer, the killing of George Floyd, the nationwide unrest, the emotional and tense and fraught conversation on race, on public policy, on policing, on the intersection of theology and race, 
on the role of the Methodist Church and the Methodist preacher in this challenging season of our lives together. So this year, for 2021, I decided to immerse myself in the writings of different perspectives to try to get uh, at least a, a glimpse of someone else's experience through the literature and the theology of black thinkers in particular. And I decided to make it a Lenten discipline to read the book that summarized Cone's lifetime of reflection on the redemption found in Christ of a world so filled with fear and hatred and bigotry and violence, which is to say, uh, a world so filled with sin. As a Methodist theologian, Cone speaks my theological language, focusing on the transformation that God wants to work in us all. As a black Methodist, he uses familiar theological language to help me understand an experience very different than my own. And as a black Methodist theologian who grew up in the Jim Crow South and came of age during the tumultuous civil rights movement, he helps me to make sense both of the, of the progress that we've made and the work that we have yet to do. As the title implies, The Cross and the Lynching Tree explores the theological connection between the suffering of Christ and uh, the victims of racial violence in our history. There are, are gruesome details from the historical record that are, that are hard to read. So too, the stories of both the hatred of the perpetrators and the indifference of the bystanders. Hard to read, but sadly, not hard to believe. In connecting the two images of, of the cross and the lynching tree, uh, Cohn summarizes what is a core tenet of the theology that he helped pioneer, and in so doing, he offers an important word for us all. He writes, the cross is the most empowering symbol of God's loving solidarity with the quote-unquote least of these, that's from Matthew 25, the unwanted in society who suffer daily from great injustices. God uh, is in solidarity with those who suffer because in Jesus Christ, God suffered too. In the earliest preaching of the church recorded in Acts, the cross was understood to have been the destructive result of human sin, as is the violence that results from fear and bigotry and hatred. Just as the resurrection was God's response on Easter Sunday, so disciples who are transformed by the Holy Spirit are part of God's response to sin since that first Easter. The way jo James Cone expresses it, followers of the crucified Christ are called to stand with those who suffer the consequences of human sin today. He writes, the real scandal of the gospel is this. Humanity's salvation is revealed in the cross of the condemned criminal Jesus, and humanity's salvation is available only through our solidarity with the crucified people in our midst. It's a powerful word. It's a word that challenges me. And as much as I respect Cone and appreciate his, his contribution to our tradition, for myself, I, I would nuance that just a bit. I would say that our salvation is lived out in solidarity with and care for those who suffer at the hands of human sin. Back when I was a youth minister, uh, I would hear an anxious question from our youth from time to time. It was a question that they were asked by their friends in other Christian traditions, and they weren't really sure how to answer it. They would sometimes wonder, am I saved? Because they often could not point to a particular aha moment in their spiritual journey. 
because we baptize infants and we tend to have spiritual awakenings of the more educational as opposed to the eventful variety. Am I saved, Chris? How do I answer that question, they would ask. And my unequivocal answer was always the same, then and now. The answer is yes, you have faith in Jesus, you are saved. But then we would ask this essential Methodist follow-up question. Saved for what? (laughs) For heaven someday? Absolutely. No doubt about it. We can all face eternity with confidence. But in the hopefully long years between now and then, we are saved in order to grow in our love for God and our fellow human beings by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit within us. Our job is to say yes to that transformation and to partner with God along the way. Theologians like James Cone remind us of an essential aspect of that transformation. Friends, we all share a common humanity and we all have a common problem. Our common solution is our salvation, offered to us through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Our faith in him has the power to transform us. May we be willing and faithful and persistent partners. Amen.